So I start the recording and I give the word to Professor Merino, who's going to introduce himself and tell us about the situation. Welcome. Thank you very much, Edme, for this invitation. It's my, my very pleasure to know you and to, and to be here at the Global Studies uh, Department, I, I guess that's the name, and at the University of Gothenburg. Thank you, thank you very much for this opportunity to be, to be here. As you said, I am the, the director of the Institute for Accountability and Against Corruption. This is a joint project uh, uh, with the University of Guadalajara in the state of Jalisco, Mexico, of course, and the Center for Research and Teaching Economics, El Cibi, with, uh, with a collaboration of uh, 22 public universities all around the country. And we have a community, an academic community of researchers. Um, we, all of us, are trying to, to understand the phenomena of corruption, which is a very elusive concept. I will say some words about it. And we are trying as well to get involved in the fight against corruption. I mean, we are not only researching, this is of course our main stream, our responsibility to research and to publish, uh, but uh, we are trying to find the ways to get some advices, some recommendations, some uh, notches sometimes to the local governments and to the federal government to fight uh, corruption. As a matter of fact, the accountability network or uh, the network for accountability La Red por la Rendición de Cuentas in Spanish has been part of the constitutional reforms on transparency and the constitutional reforms on, on the, uh, the creation of the national anti-corruption system, both the transparency system and the anti-corruption system were based on our research and with our collaboration during several years from 2028 to 2016, to 2016. It's a it's a very young approach, and we are uh, we have it, we have these two systems, the transparency system and the anti-corruption system since 2014 and 2016, respectively. Transparency and anti-corruption. Well, we have learned a lot of things. And I will try to, to tell you uh, some of, some of uh, those things that we have learned during this period. And I will try to, well, to have a conversation with you. First of all, is the obvious, the obvious uh, approach that corruption, as I said before, is a very, is a very complicated concept. The concept of, of corruption is always linked, is always referred to something. And the first point to understand corruption 
is to find out what is that something. Yeah, uh, corruption could be on the public expenses. Corruption could be a procurement system. Corruption could be based on the political struggle in the electoral system. Corruption could be based on the way the government, the public administration uh, appoint the public, the public positions. Corruption uh, can be can be fine in very many ways. Some of the principal uh, authors about corruption, as you perhaps know, uh, Heidenheimer, Johnston, uh, uh, Kliedgar, Susan Rose Ackerman, Daniel Kaufman, uh, Alina Mungyu, PPD, and you may ask many of, of them are always uh, thinking, and we are agreeing with that, that corruption is in this sense, a transitive concept. I mean, you need to name what is going to be corrupted, and then you have to see what is the point of the corruption because corruption is the change of the essence or something, whatever it is. Could be as well a tree, you know, could be the environment, could be the social uh, relations, could be anything which is losing his main essence, his originality, or what you expected from this uh, something. And then you have to study what is the way in the, what is the way in which the thing, the something is changing its nature and is changing the, its origin and taking another track. And of course, giving another result, and in some way betraying what you expected before from that something. I hope I am explaining myself. So the first uh, point is how to define corruption. The international organizations as as uh, Transparency International or the World Bank used to define corruption as in a very simple way. They, uh, they prefer to point corruption as an abuse of power, as an abuse of authority in a given public or even private positions. So the point in this very simple definition for Transparency International and the World Bank and other international organizations is the abuse. The point is how to control the abuse of authority and to avoid the uh, personal, the personal gains, you know, the, the, to have money or to have power as well from the position that you have, a public position that you have, and or even a private positions that you have, always thinking in the abuse of authority. When you take this, this proposition, this definition, you uh, can see at least two problems. First is that it is absolutely necessary to say what is the limits of the public positions and where, uh, what are the mandates? What do you expect? It's explicitly and very clearly 
of this public position. So you can uh, see where begins the abuse of the public position. If you don't have a clear definition of the public position, if you don't have a clear definition of what do you expect of this public position, what results you expect and what outcomes you want to see, it is impossible to uh, understand in what point, exactly what point, the abuse of the authority begins. This is the first problem. So uh, again, it is a transitive concept that uh, demands the definition of the results and the limits of every public position. Everyone, every single one public position should be very clear, uh, define it, to see the, the abuse of the authority that you uh, gave to that public positions. The second problem is that it is always ex post. And this is perhaps the main problem to, to, struggle, to struggle with. The corruption, when you see the corruption, you see it when it is uh, done. Uh, you see it always after the abuse. The definition of these uh, international organizations has, in my opinion, this problem, this defect. It's always ex post. And, and we need to find a way to avoid corruption ex ante. And we need to find the ways, plural, to get corruption out. So if you see corruption only as ex post situation, ex post after the abuse, of the authority or the power that you gave to the people, to the people who have uh, public positions. If you do that, it's very difficult not to go to impunity issues. So the second question is how to punish the people who had abused of the power or the authority. So the transition from corruption as a phenomena to impunity as a problem of the justice system and how to punish people and how to enforce the justice system and how to give more power to to prosecutors and to judges and to the civil society to punish the corrupt people is becoming the main stream of the, at least of the public deliberation. And of course it's very, how to say it, very juicy for the political system. Why is this very juicy? Well, because it's much better for the political system, and especially when you are trying to get votes, or you are, to, you are trying to consolidate your parties, your political parties, to accuse the others to be corrupt. And then to demand to the justice system to punish that people. It's very joicy as well because the governments uh, can uh, select who is the people uh, 
who is abusing of uh, their power, their authorities, and who's, who's, uh, who not are abusing. I mean, when you go from the corruption to the impunity issues, and you put the impunity issues only as a punish uh, issue, as a problem of punishing people, the next challenge is to decide, and I'm afraid that that decision is a very political decision, uh, who is going to be punished and who is going to be free. This is a very strong uh, weapon in the political sphere, the political arena. And we are in Mexico now seeing this problem in a very hard uh, way. Uh, one of the most important uh, speeches, one of the most important uh, ways to speak to the people of our president, Lopez Obrador, is precisely to fight corruption. But when you ask to the president, what is corruption? The answer is always people corrupted. Not corruption as a phenomena, not corruption as a system, but people corrupted. And uh, they say always that the people at the government in this moment is honest, that they are not the same than the people of the past. So the corrupt people is the people of the past, of the new liberal system. Not in this moment, not anybody in this moment. All of them are honest. All of them are trying to, to help the people. All, all of, of them are trying to, to do the best, they say. So if I am explaining myself, there is a, a change in the concept from the phenomenon of corruption, which is the abuse of authority, but is as well the, the, the corruption of, of something that you are trying to get as a good budget, as a good public administration, as a good uh, rule of law, as the guarantees of the rights, especially the human rights in the country. This is what you don't want to be corrupted. You don't want to see corrupted. This is what you want to see in, in its essence, in its original sense. But as I said before, if you go to the abuse of authority, only the abuse of authority, you are now in the legality sphere and you see corruption as an anomaly, as, a, as an exception, not as a system, but as an exception of a system in which if you don't have corrupt people, it is supposed to go perfectly, to, to be perfect, the system. And this is not true. Well, uh, to fight against this, this uh, difficult problem, first of the concept, and then the political use of the, of the concept, we built these two systems. I, I said it before, the transparency system in 2014 and the anti-corruption system in a constitutional reform in 2016. 
The transparency system is working uh, almost pretty well. I mean, we have a new culture of transparency in Mexico. This is good news. We have uh, new uh, public positions to guarantee the documentation, the archives, and trying to get the more and more information as possible in the electronic platforms. I, I see a real change in the transparency culture of the public administration. This is good news for Mexico. And this is very important to, to say this and to, and to see the possibilities to take transparency as a leverage to go against corruption as well. The bad news are on the other side in the anti-corruption system, who, has, who hasn't born at all. We have the constitutional reform in 2016, but we don't have still the institutions that the constitution established to, uh, to have a real anti-corruption system. I mean, a special prosecutor for uh, corruption uh, felonies, a new court on administrative uh, law and administrative right to punish or as well to investigate the corruption uh, activities of the, of the public administration. Uh, and a new cooperation of the, of the judicial power in a seven chairs system, one of them given to the citizens. So we have as well a new social participation committee, civil participation committee, inside the system to fight corruption in Mexico. I insist this is very good news in terms of the constitutional reform, but it is not working still. We are still waiting to be this system to be born. It's a non-NATO system. Uh, still now in 2021. Um, what, why, I mean, why the anti-corruption system is so, so weak? In the last Saxony, in the, in the former government of Mr. Enrique Peña Nieto, it was clearly stopped. It was, uh, uh, I mean, Mr. Peña Nieto didn't want to be, to, to be that system working, to see that system working. And in the actual uh, government, we see this change of position that I said before, that I tried to explain before, with Mr. President Lopes Obrador saying that this system is very expensive, that one of the main points to avoid corruption is to reduce budgets, public budgets, to eliminate uh, institutions, public institutions, and that is much better to go to go against the corrupt people. So he doesn't want to see the anti-corruption system working because from his point of view, it is expensive and it is unuseful. And it is as well part, he, say, he says this, 
is part of the neoliberalism. So he wants to change everything uh, who smell of uh, neoliberalism. No? So it's expensive, he says, it's unuseful and it's neoliberal. So he's trying to stop the anti-corruption system as well. And he's trying to get a new approach based, as I said before, only on impunity, only in the prosecution of the corrupt people. Of course, deciding from the government, from the, from the central government, I insist, who is corrupt and who is not corrupt. Uh, it is not easy to, to see what is going on in the next year. Where we are in Mexico, as you know, it may and, and the colleagues in this webinar perhaps know, in Mexico, we are in the middle of the electoral process. In the next uh, June, uh, June 6, we are going to have uh, the, the electoral uh, day. And, uh, and we will know if the Morena, Morena, uh, which is the, the dominant party, the party of the President Lopez Obrador, is going to win the election or not. Uh, with the information we have right now, we may say that uh, Morena is going to will to win the election and it's very probably that the president Lopez Obrador is, is going to have absolute majority in the deputy chamber and the Morena the party is going to win as well in very other parts of the country. This is a federal country, as you know, and we, we we're going to decide 15 countries is, are going to change the governors. And it is very probably that uh, at least eight uh, of them are going to be from Morena and as well, the majority in the deputy chamber. So it's, uh, it's difficult to say what is going to happen with the transparency system and with the anti-corruption system, because both of them are challenged by the president. I mean, explicitly, the president said that if Morena wins the next election, the institution that guarantee transparency in Mexico named INAI, the National Institution for Access to Information, INAI, is going to be disappear. It's going to be eliminated in order to get the attributions of this institution to the central government. And he said as well that after June, uh, the anti-corruption the anti system as well is going to be eliminated in order to put their faculties, their attributions, their outcomes in the central government as well. I mean, it's very probably, I hope not, I really hope not. This is not my position, but I can see that if the election is as we may, as, as we are seeing right now, and if Morena win uh, the majority, the deputy chamber, the probability to be the elimination of the 
Transparency Institute and the anti-corruption system is very high. And from that, it may we are going to begin again. It's a long way, a very long way that it took to, to came to the transparency system and to got the anti-corruption system in the last years. What we are seeing, and this is not a pessimistic point of view, is, is what is going on right now, is what's happening right now in Mexico. We can see that, this insists very probably, that the things are going to, to go uh, out and that we, are, we need to, to get to the very beginning of the way. Like again, once again. Well, I believe that this is enough for the first conversation. I, I, I think so. But of course, uh, whatever you want, it's my pleasure to be here. I hope you are understanding my awful English. And, uh, uh, and I hope that we can have a, a nice conversation. Thank you. Thank you, Mauricio. And it's perfect because you did a very good introduction to the to the thing, and I was going to uh, I'm going to be the first to start the conversation to start the questions and afterwards I suggest the people that are here that the, you put uh, your hand up or in a chat also um, point out that you want to. Do you want to, to have a question or a comment on what Mauricio has said? But I'm, I'm going to start this. Um, you said that this Institute for Transparency and, and, and Access to Information was yes. founded uh, several years ago. And I would like to go to its founding. How, how did the people who wanted to have this manage to do it? during a time when corruption was so hard as well, because before you have a, 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 the former president, um, Peña Nieto, but before him, you didn't have very good governments either regarding transparency or regarding the lack of corruption. So how did it happen that this institute could start? And then you would have also this reform to which you refer. What were the circumstances for this? Uh, thank you, Edme. Uh, I believe that it is important to explain that the Access to Information Institution uh, uh, has been three different moments from 2003 then the second moment, important moment, was to, uh, 2007, and the last is 2014, as I said before. The uh, access to information system began as an institution uh, which was part of the central government just the federal government. And he had a very, a very weak, a very narrow mandate, a very narrow attributions, only to get the public documents in the federal archives. And that's it. Of course, it was a great, a great change from we had before that. I mean, to get access to the public documents in all the federal government was a very good news for a country with a very authoritarian regime before the before this century, before the 2000, when the transitions uh, political transition, as you know, 
came with Vicente Fox exactly in the 2000 year. So in 2003, three years before the arrival of the transition of the alternance in the, in the presidency of Mexico, we have this new uh, access to information institution, but as I said before, only for federal documents, only for federal archives and being part of the federal government as well. With some autonomy, technical autonomy, of course, and with uh, great people, by the way, appointed to do their best. They are really great people. Jacqueline Pechard, Juan Pablo Guerrero. We still, uh, we still remember them because uh, this group of commissioners, that's the name, of the IFI, the Federal uh, Institute for to Access to Information. It, uh, they did a very great job to rise, you know, this new institution. The problem uh, was in, in that time in the local level. We have, we have at the same time, this new access to information uh, institution and a very blocked, a very dark <coughs> situation in the local governments. Uh, most of them, most of the local governments adopted as well uh, local uh, institutions to guarantee the right to access to public information. But they, they were absolutely uh, fake, you know? It was not working, was captured by the governors. And well, I, I, I don't want to make a long story. The point is that we have in 2007, the conscious, of having two different uh, ways to get information. In the federal way, we had, uh, we had advances, we had good news, but in the local, the contrary, the opposite. So we demanded, by the way, with a, a network of accountability or for accountability with the Red for la Rendición de Cuentas, since then, a change in the constitution, the federal constitution, the national constitution, to put in there, in the constitution, the basic principles to obligate all the country to get information, not only the federal government, but the local governments as well. Mm -hmm. So we have the, the second, second stage, no? We won that, and we got the constitutional reform in 2007. And from then, from then, we uh, had a new framework, legal framework, to demand the access to information all around the country, even in the municipal, level, in the very, very local level of the country. It was great, good news for, for Mexico. But still, we had new problems, new resistances, you know, new bureaucratic answers. And uh, then began the typical answer of no existence of the document, no existence of the information. I mean, if you went to ask some information, the main, the principal, the, the very often uh, answer was, it is not exist. Mm. Sorry, we don't have it because it doesn't exist. The information that you are 
asking for. So it was necessary again to go to another transformation, uh, which included the protection of the personal data, the private uh, life, and which included, believe it or not, a brand new law of archives. We didn't have in Mexico a general law to manage the public documents, to put order in the information given and to, and to have a good archive system. Archive is the, is the right word, yes, archivos. Yes. Okay, because archive could be understand, understand as a, the old documents. And I, I am referring to the actual documents, the documents in which you are working right now in the mm -hmm. public administration, mm -hmm and that you need to, to do things, to decide things, to, to go further with mm -hmm. any, any issue in the public administration. Well, we didn't have a regulation for this uh, documental managing archives. Uh, so it was absolutely necessary to go to the new reform, the third in 2014. And in 2014, born the new National Institute, not just the Federal Institute, the former Federal Institute for Public Information Access, but the National Institute for Public Information Access. I insist it was very, very good news because it may, uh, this new reform obligated as well uh, the trade unions or the political parties for the very first time, or any person who manage public expenses or public money. Everyone is obligated to give information in terms of this last reform of 2014. In every, in every uh, temporada, in every época, 2003, 2007, and 2014, I really believe, I do believe that the National Institute uh, did its job. Correct. Now, President López Obrador is saying that it is very expensive, you know? but it is not. It is not because uh, the National Institute for Access to Information uh, has a lot of obligations, a lot of faculties. So you need money to work on it. So I believe it is not expense, expensive. And I do believe that the people in there, in the National Institute is working as well, very well. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's good news all the way from 2003 to now. It's good news. We have good news from that uh, National Institute for Access to Information. Okay, I don't I don't see any questions uh, up to now, but I would like to continue. Uh, uh, well, we have a question, but before we go to this question from Shirley, uh, I would like to ask you, uh, Mauricio. Yes. It, why? I mean, I know the president is carrying out this enormous campaign, uh, which is. Uh, trying to save money. Yes. Austeridad Republicana, he calls it. Yes, yes, yes. yes. To austerity, save. austerity. Yes. Uh, and, and, and why if his main 
discourse is against corruption? Does he focus precisely on this particular institute? Is it, a, is it also that he feels that this institute would be monitoring his government, observing what it what happens in reality? You may say that. Mm. You may say that. Uh, because when you have access to the public information and you have a uh, uh, civil society, uh, a well organized civil society trying to get information, of course, you may have a challenge to the governments. And this is precisely the idea of the of to have a public administration act this is exactly why we need this public administration act i mean to to have a democratic control on the exercise of power in mexico and all over the world so you may say of course that any government in the world perhaps perhaps I say, prefer not to have this pressure, this social mm -hmm. pressure, and perhaps to give to the people what they want to give, and that's all. So yes, you may say that it's not only a problem of austerity or a problem of, uh, of uh, anti-neoliberal point of view, whatever it is, mm -hmm. but it's as well, uh, uh, a position against the very existence of this kind of public transfer to information acts. You, you may say that, but the public discourse, the public position, I mean, the, uh, the speech of the president is in favor of austerity. So mm -hmm. he's justifying the attack, the the fight against this institute of transparency in Mexico based on the idea that it is very expensive. He's not given any other information. It's, I, I would like to tell you something else and to elaborate you know, with this idea, but it is impossible because the only answer from uh, the Mexican government right now is that it is very expensive and that it is worth to cut these expenses, these public expenses, in order to have these expenses to the social programs, to give this money to the people directly. And this is the explanation. I, I mean it. This, this is the explanation. My, my concern as a research researcher is uh, is that it is going as well to the impunity sphere. I mean, as I said before, corruption is not only impunity. It's as well impunity. You may say, okay, Professor Marino, are you telling me that impunity is not important? to fight against corruption? No, I, I am not telling that. I clearly understand that you need to go against impunity to control corruption, of course. But if you only go against corruption and you do not do anything else, what you have is a lot of people in jail and you have still the same causes of corruption still alive. To my students, I used to, to tell them, trying to explain my point, asking them, how many people in jail do you need to eliminate corruption? Two thousand and. 500 or only 
25, how many? I mean, it's absurd to say that only impunity is a way to fight against corruption. This is my point. And well, nevertheless, Mr. President Lopez Obrador is uh, repeating almost every, every morning because he has, as you know, this uh, Mañanera. Conferencia Mañanera, this uh, morning conference no, to the press every day. And I do not exaggerate or not exaggerate too much if, as, if I say that almost every morning he uh, go against transparency, the Institute of Transparency, and against corrupt people, depending on the issue. And of course, all the corrupts are always from the former government. That's that's the point. Here, uh, Mauricio, we have a question. How is corruption discovered? Which... Uh, that's a very good question. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, I, I thank very much this question because it allows me to, allows me to, to go again and again to the same definition. Corruption now is discovered ex post, always. It's discovered when the felony is already committed when the crime is already committed. Always is ex post, not ex ante. And this is part of the problem, as I has been saying all the way. When you look, when you discover corruption, it's because something went wrong. It's because you saw that somebody took the public money is when you saw, when you discovered that the accountability is not okay, that something is missing in the public money, and you uh, find out that somebody took that money or took that uh, authority to get more power to, to his party or to his group, his political group or to his family or or himself eventually no uh, it doesn't matter well yes it does matter where uh, the money goes always but the point is that you discover corruption when it is very late when the corruption is there and you can see the corruption uh, for the evidence that you can see, that you can touch even. Just for example, allow me to, to say this, just last Tuesday, this week, we had a very tragic situation in Mexico City, for example. The underground is not underground in this case, the metro, how, how do you say this? The metro, the subway, the metro. The subway system. The subway system in Mexico City has, and as well in many other countries, an elevated trains. Mm. Some, of, some of them are elevated, not underground, but elevated. Okay, well, just this Saturday, this Tuesday, last Tuesday, a part of the elevated uh, metro, the subway system, collapsed, has broken, got down. And it's a, it's a tragedy because 25, 25 people died last Tuesday because corruption 
because somebody did something wrong in the construction of, a, of this part of the subway. Somebody took the money, somebody did, did the things different that you expected to be done. So people died this Tuesday. You discovered corruption after exposed when the people is already die and when you know that corruption was there. And this is the only explanation to, to explain why a part of the subway got down in this way. I, I believe, I, I hope that you understand my point. Yes, sir. Uh, we have another question now, and is um, is corruption part of our culture, as Peña Nieto once said? Yes, yes. I, I know that this is a very polemic point of view, and it's of course a very uh, how to say it a very uh, thin, I don't like a president saying that it's just a cultural problem. This, this is part of our ADN, whatever, DDA, come say this in English, sorry, ADSO. No, you understood that. It's part of us, it's part of our spirit, no, as Mexicans. Of course, the answer, from Mr. President Peña Nieto was very polemic and very, very fighted in, in, in the moment. But we have to say that uh, it's part of the problem. It's not the problem, but it's part of the problem. When people accept briberies or give briberies, when people accept that you need leverages to get uh, public services or to get best the best public services. When people accept that uh, it is worth to have some people in there in the government to help you just in case. When people accept this and normalize this kind of behavior, what you have is a cultural problem. Is not enough to change this cultural approach, this acceptance, this social acceptance to change corruption, of course. But you have to work at the same time in the public administration systems, in the public positions, I mean, in the way that people get the public positions, not only because they are very friendly or very close to the political party in the government or because they are part of a family of the empowered people in, in the government, but because the merit and because the, the, their careers uh, and you have to change the procurement system. You have to change the prosecutor system. You have to change the administrative law to complete a real fight against corruption. You have to go to the evaluation of the public policies. You have to go to the monitor of the public implementation. You have to go to the fiscalization of the public expenses all the time. You have to do many things, many administrative things, archives, documental managing. Many things to do are still waiting to fight corruption. But doing that, you need to change as well the cultural approach that approves in some way 
that corrupt is is okay or even that you are able I insist a bribery or a leverage or or to get some privilege privilege is the absence of is the absence of of the law as you know if you go if you accept this kind of practices of course it's much more difficult to fight against corruption mm -hmm. yes and uh, i don't see any new questions but i would like to say okay. you i mean corruption is uh, has as you say a many different steps and many different activities it, it is yes. not only to get money from anybody but yes. to to obtain privileges which are yes. not supposed to be there for you to use yes and do you think this is the same kind of perception that the president has of corruption no i'm sure now is a very easy answer. No, no, not at all. No, uh, Mr. President, I'm sure about it, thinks that public administration is a kind of uh, estorbo, it's a kind of, uh, of thing that you can avoid, generally speaking. This is the reason why he decided, for example, to get more faculties and more uh, attributions and more public uh, policies to the army, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the army. Now we have um, an army very empowered by this president doing many, many things. I mean, building roads, is the managing the aduanas, uh, of course, doing their jobs at the at the fronteras. The I lost the word. Sorry, the, the borders. Yes, at the borders. Uh, but the army is doing many things because Mr. President has a great confidence in the army. And he has uh, no confidence at all in the public administration. Why? Because the people who is in the public administration came from the new liberal system. They, he says so. Mm -hmm. So yes, the answer is not at all. There is no no confidence, and the approach of Mr. President is quite different from from mine, or for, from this approach that we are speaking about. But I mean, if if the president, as you say, trusts the army, does he really think the army is not corrupt? I don't know what exactly think the president is difficult, but he says, he explicit, explicitly have said, that the army is honest. Yes, explicitly. And the army is better. Explicitly. <laughs> no, I say that because there have been a lot of scandals around the army. Precisely yes, I know. Say because it's it engaged in a lot of economic activities. And there are many hey, scandals may, around it. May I take two minutes? Yes. Just two minutes in this conversation. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. We can we can make a, a very short break, yes. Uh, if anybody else that wants to uh, formulate a question, this is the time to do it because we have only 15 minutes left. So please take advantage and that we have. Mauricio here to put any questions you want. I see one here. Mm. 
Yeah. From Ukraine, yes. Any more, any other people putting questions? We are recording this uh, this webinar, so it's going to be available as well as with the other webinars in the page of Ayotzinapa. In case you want to uh, share it with any anybody, it's going to be available soon, I hope. But uh, and then we have this question. Any more questions? Any more comments? Okay, Mauricio, we have another Appreciate question. Appreciate very much. Thank you. Yes, you have another question. We talk about the corruption in Mexico, but very often about foreign companies and foreign governments interested in preserving the corruption yes. in Mexico. What would you say about that? That's true. When uh, uh, international enterprises find an environment of corruption, they use it to, to increase their incomes. Mm -hmm. That's uh, that's a point, for example, of Daniel Kaufman studies, no? at the first at the World Bank, especially, especially with the extractive industry, mm -hmm. but as well as well with the medical industry. Is uh, is very usual, and we have a lot of evidence. By the way, talking about cultural approaches, no. Uh, the behavior of these enterprises change between the countries when they find that they can make more business, given briberies even uh, even I don't know political exposures, for example, because corruption is not only money, as you said before, and may I do agree with you, corruption is power as well. I mean, you may get not only more money or much more richness, you can be more powerful woman or man with or a long corruption. So the enterprises, this kind of uh, international enterprises, firms, used to modify their behavior, behavior depending on the cultural and political environment in which they are going to act because they want to make money. They want to make business. So they are able, may very often, not always, but very often to uh, participate in the corruption arrangements. We have the very, I mean, uh, uh, the perfect example no? with Odebrecht. Mm. Odebrecht is a, was an uh, international enterprise building and uh, from Brazil. And they began to corrupt people almost every, everywhere in America Latina. Mm -hmm. It was because of the break that many presidents and vice presidents uh, went out of their countries in Peru, for example. Mm -hmm in Guatemala, in, uh, I mean, in Brazil, of course, the problem of Mr. Lula da Silva, Dilma Rousseff, Alan Garcia, who shot himself terrible because the Odebrecht case. And we are still leading with the Odebrecht case here in Mexico right now with the ex-director of uh, the Petroleum Company of Mexico, Pemex. I mean, this is a very good example of the break, but you can take OHL, you can take, uh, there is a lot of examples uh, to explain that yes, 
the environment, the political and cultural environment, I insist, in where these enterprises are going to uh, make business is very important to avoid or to, or the contrary, to, to favorecer, to favor the, the corruption in, in different countries. I'm afraid that this is the truth, yes. <laughs> And I, I want to take advantage of that no, nobody else is asking to ask you about uh, the near future. You were saying that in these elections, it is already foreseen that Morena is going to get a majority again. And yes. then it's uh, something which is expected that uh, the government is going to dismantle this institution, yes. ECFI. And yes. what is the resistance to this? For example, what, what, are, what is the power of civil society groups to stop, it's weak. To stop that? It's issue? weak, it's weak. We have, uh, I mean, there is a lot of resistance. If you see uh, the academic uh, uh, ground, I do not know, really, I do not know any of my colleagues agreeing with the dismantling of, of the institution for transparency or the institutions for, for fight against corruption. But especially in the transparency issue, there is a consensus in the academic ground, at least. And there, uh, there is another consensus in the civil society organizations as well. Really, I don't see anybody saying that uh, the elimination of this institute is going to be a good news for, for democracy or for, or for the fight for the human rights or for to fight against corruption, anyone, only the people very close to Morena, mm. who is repeating once and twice and again and again, that this is a good decision because austerity, because it is expensive, I insist, because the money should go to the poor people better than to the institution and because they will really believe mo many of these people very very close to morena and we know some of them they really believe they are not even us a fake uh, you know face no they are really really believing they are believers, that's what I want to say, <laughs> that this transformation is going to be much better than the past. And when you ask them exactly what this, what is this transformation going to be, they cannot answer. They say, is the elimination, the destruction of the past, is the destruction of the corruption, is the destruction of the abuse, uh, of the abusing system is the destruction of the lack of uh, veracity, is the destruction of the neoliberal system as a whole. And this is good for everybody. But what is going to be after that? That's the next question. Okay, we can agree, we may agree that we have a very corrupted system, of course. And it was, without any doubt, that was because we fight for these systems. And 30 years fighting to try to avoid corruption. Yes, you are right. But if you destroyed everything that was built in the, in the past, not for the governments, but for the civil society and the academic and the international 
I mean, international solidarity of social organizations. If you destroy that, what is going to be next? And the answer is always the same, austerity, more social programs, and a new regime. What is the name of that new regime is the next question if you want. And they don't answer because they, they don't have an answer. That's the truth. It's a, just a new regime, different from the neoliberalism. My last question, Mauricio. Do you think that these, uh, the, the groups that really support Lopez Obrador, and I'm not referring to these believers among the intellectuals or some of the intellectuals, but I'm referring to uh, poor sectors of the population that believe in him and that support him. Do you think they realize the consequences of these kind of measures? Or in other words, is it uh, important for them to keep this kind of access to transparency? Or they don't give any importance to this? That's a very good question. There is a gap, a great gap between the democratic system in every single part of the democratic system and the social system. Mm. This is another conversation, no? It's a, it's a very important, I mean, issue just to, to say this in this way, no? But allow me to, to, to say it in uh, briefly, no? But yes, there is a gap between the social structure and the social system, especially with the poor people. And you know, the poor people is majority in Mexico, great majority in Mexico. And the elite, you know, the elite uh, that uh, is taking, is making decisions and, and the elite uh, that, uh, that is thinking about democracy. And yes, there is a gap, absolutely yes. Now, the more and more uh, new social organizations are using the Public uh, Information Act, the Access to Public Information Act, the more and more, I, I, I'm going to give you two examples that are very near of my experience. And I believe are enough to explain myself. First is the medicines, mm. the medicines. During the pandemic, during the last year, 2020, we have a great problem to get medicines not, uh, not linked with the COVID-19, but the other diseases, tuberculosis, uh, SIDA, VIH, VIH, este, you know, uh, sclerosis, uh, diabetes, the other diseases, with a lot of people who needed medicines and they have the right to get those medicines. It's a constitutional right. If you, in Mexico, if you have a treatment, a public treatment, medical treatment, you have the right to obtain all the way in the medical treatment, not only the consult with the, physician, but all the treatment with the medicines included, of course. Well, during uh, 2020, the procurement of medicines uh, got down and we began not to have enough medicines to 
several of the most critical diseases in the country. You may see this, this report in Cero de Sabasto, if you wish to, to see it, Cero de Sabasto dot, uh, uh, or as uh, Cero de Sabasto punto org dot or, or, or G. And you may see this information. So when the problem of medicines came to the poor people, because it's a problem of the poor people. Rich people can go to the private sector, you know, may buy their medicines, even may go out of the country, go to Houston, no? It's, it's in some way very usual to rich people in Mexico, to the elite in Mexico, to go to Houston, Texas, no? To get um, the best medicine, they say, in the world, I'm not sure about it, but I say so. But the poor people, no, the poor people need the public health service and they don't have enough medicines. So thanks to the Public to Information uh, Act, uh, the Access to Public Information Act, thank, thanks to the INAI, allow me to name it this way, INAI, the National Institute for Public information. Thanks to that, we know now exactly how many medicines are out of the market, how many people didn't receive the recipes, they didn't receive treatment, and we're talking about millions of people, millions of people. So, the consequence of this information, of this use of the public information was the uh, integration of associations of patients, patients of cancer, diabetes, VIH, many diseases who put in a same organization, in a same association, these patients all around the country. So we have now 55, it's a lot, organizations fighting against the lack of medicines in the country, thanks to the public administration access mm. information. Uh, I, I think this is a good example. If you think, the second was the lack of rights to the workers, to the workers, domestic workers. Mm -hmm. Is this the way to say it in English? Yeah, domestic, domestic workers. workers yes. uh, thanks to the to the access to information, the access to the public information, we have now a new trade onion. Um, of uh, domestic workers in Mexico, and they now know what kind of rights they can access to and how to get these kind of rights right now. It's a, it's, I, I believe this is a very good news for, for 2 million and 5,000 people who is in Mexico domestic work. So I hope these are two good examples that if you go to the public, to the public information access, only in that terms, the gap is very big. But if you go to the public, to the access to the public information act with causes, with reasons, with real problems, you know, with with the pain showing in the in the people, and you know that you can relieve some of that pain thanks to the public information, then you have a great difference, uh, and the gap is is uh, se recorta. The gap is Cut. broken. Yes. Okay. That's it. Very, very good. 
Thank you very much, Mauricio. I think we have to stop. We were supposed to stop uh, some minutes ago, but uh, it has been a real pleasure to have you today and uh, to have all these inputs on what is happening regarding transparency and accountability. And I hope we will continue this conversation with you sometime in the future after the elections yeah. to see okay. what is happening and yeah. uh, if our these um, very dark premonitions become reality <laughs> i hope not but uh, given the situation we have to respect the worst so uh, again thank you and thank you everybody who came here and as we said we are going hopefully to re to to make this uh, recording available Gracias, thank you. Thank you very much. De veras. Y, thank you very y, much. Eh, esperamos tenerte en algún momento en el futuro otra vez. Con sí. ¿Eh? Y pensemos en futuras colaboraciones. Me encantará. Qué gusto de veras saludarte. Mm -hmm. Ya les voy a presumir en el Colegio de México. Sí. La próxima vez que los vea. <risa> ok. <risa> muchas gracias y muchas gracias. Hasta a todos. luego. Goodbye. Igualmente. Bye bye.